Hello, fellow armchair generals. We're going to talk a bit about Spain, and this is not meant to be some sort of um, all-inclusive um, video, and there's some really great documentary series on the Spanish Civil War in Spain. I was asked by USA man, how much difference would national Spain make if they joined the Axis? And, well, my opinion has long, long been that had Italy stayed out of World War II, it would have greatly helped Germany because, and but be friendly to Germany. And so, well, the, you know, if you have, well, you could, you know, Britain or the U.S. could invade um, V.C. France, in the south here, but Italy would be sitting here with the sort of threat of joining the war, especially when Britain is Britain alone. And so it has a significant navy. You can't invade through here. And coming invading, you keep Greece out of the war, you keep Yugoslavia out of the war, so the Allies aren't going to invade down here. So Germany can ignore all of this stuff and have some degree of resource trading from Italy to Germany. I don't know whether that's big-time trading or a trickle of trade, but some some level of trade coming up to Germany. And that would have helped Germany. Okay, Spain if you bring it into the war, it's just that on steroids. It's, oh, we've got, Germany now has to defend all of this territory additionally. And yes, as um, Aries talked about, um, Gibraltar probably would have quickly fallen. Um, yeah, I, I can't I can't see it. It's withstanding a modern, I mean, the guys in the tunnels would you know, that are in the rock there. Um, and the British repair expert, I have not been to Gibraltar, been in those tunnels, but I have been through a tunnel made by um, the British with experience from Gibraltar. Um, in Edinburgh, there's Edinburgh Castle. Well, in the modern time, um, I know, maybe back in the 80s it was or something, they tunnel through part of the rock. It, it's, a, it's a volcanic plug, very very hard, very thick, um, to give sort of a driving tunnel up into the castle instead of going through the tradition or the original sort of gate works to get into the center of the, the castle. I've um, really, I've had the privilege of driving my car up into there because of some video shoot I was involved with many, many years ago in, in there. So we, we started before the castle opened in the morning. So we drove in through there and I did drive out later. So I've gone through one of the tunnels and it was explained to me that um, the British through their expertise of tunneling through Gibraltar used that to tunnel effectively through the castle without disturbing a lot of the historical elements of the rock of you know, the rock itself and then the castle around it and whatnot but so there's a lot of the ability to withstand the siege there but all the sort of Gibraltar city and the port and the airport there just would be blasted by Spanish art Spanish slash German artillery and yeah there might be some sort of long siege by by guys in tunnels but otherwise um, it's over pretty quick for everything else. But the big problem is, really, is food. And when, like I said, we were talking a bit about Spain, not just in World War II, but Spain leading up to it. Spain's economy, I am in, say, I don't know, 1920, is still... Looking back uh, 100, 150 years, in the way they farm, you know, in their farming methods, in their farming organization, often it's massive landowners with um, peasants sort of maybe not quite tied to the land, but are there, and this is still like the 1920, and using... Um, Entirely, basically, you know, at least in, in the large, I mean, I'm sure you can find some fat, um, some tractors or something around, but almost the entirety of, of food production, the, the vast majority, is entirely muscle powered, whether it's human muscle power or animal muscle power, 
in, in its production, in its um, refinement, you know, um, taking, you know, wheat once it's cut down and turning it into grain and then turning it into flour is muscle power or, well, I guess there's wind and water a little bit for, you know, windmills and water mills. Uh, but that's, it's, this is into the 20s and it's, it's all muscle powered and it's very inefficient. It's, it's just a very backward country and it's, Part of the reason, and there's multiple reasons for the Spanish Civil War, and as one of the documentaries I was recently re-watching about it, um, a lot of the foreigners that came to Spain, particularly they're talking about foreign volunteers, not so much about the Italians or the Germans or the Soviet advisors. There really weren't Soviet divisions in Spain, though. Um, but all the other people that sort of came on both sides of the faction saw the war in sort of big ideological terms, you know, socialism, communism versus fascism or whatever, or um, God versus atheism, because I think a lot of the Irish volunteers that go on the national side aren't really like diehard fascists. A lot of them are sort of rabid um, Catholic type supporters, been radicalized by Protestant uh, British treatment of the Irish. I think there's some of that sentiment there. So they're coming fighting for the cross, as it were, or whatever. So there's a lot of causes. And the Spanish sort of like, yeah, you're not understanding the real local reasons for this war. And there's a lot of lot of various local region, reasons. And some of them are very regional, you know, just affecting one little part. And one faction, for one reason or another, ends up, you know, one faction up here ends up being in part of the major faction, Republican or nationalist, because something aligns to it. But it might mean that um, your Basques may, may be, um, and I don't even know where the Basques, quite honestly, came down on the Spanish Civil War right now, but they might they might be very, I think the Basque were generally very religious, but I'm guessing they might have been on the Republican side. I'm not sure. Just because they're sort of anti-centralist, centralized government um, or something. So you get some of these kind of things. So you get people sort of not fully, you know, disagreeing vehemently with what the propaganda is coming out from the sort of central their side, just because their local interest puts them on the other faction kind of thing. Hope you get it. But okay, so Spain is devastated by this, the Spanish Civil War, and it still has a primitive food growth. So Spain is maybe not quite starving like we were talking earlier before making this episode. Um, Ireland and the Irish potato blight and the, the, the problems in the latter part of the 19th century in Ireland for food. But Spain needs massive amounts of food to keep its populations fed. Now, Hitler comes down to Spain um, and then maybe to Zaragoza or somewhere down here, I think, for a visit and meets. And another time there, right, just sort of at the border somewhere comes down and meets with, um, maybe I'm thinking Zaragoza and Himmler, I don't know, um, but comes down and meets with Franco. And Hitler wants to get Spain into the Axis and into the war. Again, I say stupidly because it's better for them to not be in the war. And now realize that once France falls, Germans are buying guns made in Spain. I I have a, an Astra pistol that was basically a contract build for the Germans, and they built them specifically in 9mm Parabellum instead of Largo. They were building them for the Germans. Now, mine never got accepted by the Germans, so there's no, there's no you know, Boffinamp stamps on it. So it was probably part of the contract that was either built and not shipped because um, cut off from Spain or they just continued to build some as Germany's still dying. But basically, by the end of 45, they stopped building the pistols in that caliber, in that setting. So um, they're building like things like pistols, actually in this part of Spain, and other things that they're selling to Germany 
So the trains are going back and forth during the war years once France falls with supplies for Germany of one sort or another, including a lot of either called Wolfram, but we know it in the modern sense, tungsten um, being acquired from both sides of the, the border uh, with Portugal here and refined a bit and sent into Germany, um, massively needed strategic resource for Germany. So Spain is trading heavily with Germany during the war years. But Hitler wants them in the war. So Franco, and I know this can take you out of context, and I'm not saying I, to me, Franco is a hero. He, he, I'm not saying he's a good guy because he does bad things, but I don't know whether he's a good guy or bad guy, even though he does bad things, because he's in a bad situation. Okay, Franco finds himself in a bad situation, and he, I mean, God, that can take be taken out of context years from now, and Ari knows sort of some of my problems with saying that. But one of the things that he makes me his hero is what he does with Hitler, is he keeps Spain out of the war. He, he, now there, there are, if you will, concentration camps, not death camps, nothing like that to the best of my knowledge, but there are still camps with a lot of Republicans, we'll call them, people that were, now there's huge numbers of Republicans. Tens of thousands of Republican soldiers flee Spain, get out and get primarily to um, France. But there's a lot captured, surrendered, whatever. Now, many of the just average soldiers do sort of get to go home, but there are a lot of the sort of leader types in, in the thousands that are still in camps. But these are diehard in many cases, diehard communists and others that would love to overthrow and wreck the regime, you know, and do you trust them and just let them out? Well, of course, if you're a leftist, you, you'll say yes, because you want them to get out and then cause trouble. Um, so I'm not saying it's right what he was doing, but he at least thinks he's trying to preserve peace. But so Franco's trying to reduce human misery, okay? He really is. And this is a time in which, you know, there's a fucking world war going on, and he's keeping his nation out of it. So that's sort of why I see him as a bit of a hero. Now, again, he might be a, you know, a, a hero with a lot of black marks against his name. Granted, I'm not going to argue with some of the people, oh, well, and not, and not everything, because... Franco was not a fascist. The Phalangist group was a subgroup. His main, um, uh, oh, I shouldn't even, the foreign minister of Spain during the World War is a, is a um, uh, Phalangist, uh, you know, a fascist. So there are fascists in his government. He is a nationalist. And so, you know, yeah, there, it's not a 100% good guy. I'm not saying that. But he's trying to reduce human misery, and he's keeping his nation out of the war. And so when Hitler wants him into the war, and this is at a time when it's sort of Britain alone, and I think it was before the invasion of the Soviet Union starts. I'd have to check that date. Hitler comes down and has a meeting with Franco. Now, Franco doesn't like Hitler, and because Hitler doesn't get what he wants, he doesn't like Hitler doesn't like Franco. But... Um, Basically, Franco realizes, if I tell Hitler no, he might, not saying he would, and I think there was definitely, a, if not explicitly stated, a general implied threat that they might, um, you know, and Hitler is either at different times wanting to simply have access to be able to attack Gibraltar in Spain, um, Franco says no to that, um, because he thinks it would, you know, um, open access. There are covert operations going on, but open access um, for the Germans in Spain, Franco says no. But, but if he generally says no to go, joining the war, Hitler may invade, and Hitler's looking like unstoppable. This is, I do believe, before the, the invasion of the Soviet Union, or when this early days of the Soviet Union invasion is going well. So Franco's afraid of being invaded. So Franco, it, 
is a smart cookie. So what he says is, Sure, Hitler, I'll join the war. Here's my big, long list of needs I need fulfilled before I could possibly join the war. And it's, and it's created a, 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 risk, a list of real needs of Spain. But, and I'm not saying it's inflated, but it's sort of like a wish list. Now, some of it is like, oh, hey, we need, you know, a bunch more aircraft and a bunch more tanks and things like that that you might expect. But one of the big line items is, oh, we need this many tons of food delivered per month. Start delivering all this food to us and we'll join your war, Hitler. Basically knowing that yeah, Germany's in a bit of a food crisis and isn't going to have the food and isn't going to have all these resources. So he creates a list that isn't like some radically could never happen you know, or, you know, he's just asking for the world or whatever, but he's asking for um, a set of stuff that is not likely to be fulfilled. So Hitler goes away with, uh, yes, as soon as you do this impossible list, we'll join your war. And so this gets to the point of if Spain joins the war. Well, Spain, we talked about he's there, you know, constantly trading with Germany. Again, weapons raw materials are are going mostly through this part because they're not trading so much via Vichy um, going into Spain. And there's some secret cooperation with U-boats. The Germans at some point put a radar station in one of these islands to sort of watch in that part of the Mediterranean that, the, that I think it's this one that the Spanish are not allowed into the building. They're providing general security for it and the Germans are there in non-uniforms you know so they're not officially there as any soldiers or anything but they're they're manning the radar with the idea that they're supposed to destroy the radar before letting it fall into either Spanish or anybody else's hands um, and sort of reporting you know if if there's reporting to S Spain if what's not you know if they spot things but it you know to keep it secret is is more of that kind of stuff so there's there's sort of covert cooperation and also cooperation with Italy we can go into that some other time but so they're trading with Germany but they need food they need food desperately and part of the reason they're trading with Germany is they're making money and they're um, insisting that they're being paid by things other than German Reichmarks, gold, silver, and maybe some of this is counter. Some of the other stuff is counterfeit is things like British pounds, U.S. dollars. And of course, when Germany rolls into some of these countries, they pick up large reserves, you know, that are in national banks and whatnot of some of these things. And so Spain, I know, and I don't know in detail, but it's like, trying to import food from places like Argentina, Brazil, whatever. So all of that food that's coming into Spain, as well as its contact with its minor sort of colonies out here, um, would be almost instantly cut off. I mean, it might sort of get a little bit of, you know, when this is Vichy territory contact down here but everything else is instantly cut off as soon as you go to war with even just the British without the Americans so I'll get to the back to the chat in a moment guys so Spain coming into the war for Germany in my opinion is a huge liability and then even if even if you don't have the food crisis situation, somehow you were able to get twice as much grain out of Ukraine or I don't know, um, whatever it might be, um, fulfill the, and I, I know they need lots of food and I know they need to import it. They're trying to increase food production in Spain, trying to modernize I don't even know if today, if Spain is a net food importer or exporter for basic calories. Often you'll have a country like Spain that will, and I know they, they I know they have a lot of greenhouses in Spain now. And I don't know if, I think a lot of that is to, to minimize water usage. So evaporation is or condensation into the, um, 
sort of plastic, um, sort of create mini little rain ideas so that the water doesn't all evaporate out. Sometimes you do um, specialty foods grown in a place like Spain to sell to, you know, other parts of Europe and whatnot. And so that's a cash crop. And so then it's cheaper to, I don't know, import U.S. or Canadian grain for just basic feeding the people where you could turn the land over from a cash crop to a food crop, you know, local use food crop. I don't know. I still don't know whether it's and of course, population levels change. So the population levels may have post-war blossomed out. And so they never got to the way of a food problem. But so even without the food problem. Um, yeah, Spain is a, um, and I've been reading, uh, the, um, uh, uh, a multi volume series on the Peninsula War, which is, you know, um, the Napoleonic Wars happening down in Spain is a very mountainous, very rugged country. It isn't going to be blitzing across like you can do this sort of northern plains of France, you know, sort of eh, the, the level of delay that the, the sort of bocage, which is sort of super hedges, happened here was a, a little bit of a surprise to the Allies. Yes, they had aerial photos. Yes, they knew what was going on. But just to the, the sort of almost creating pseudo city like environments, there was a little bit of a oopsie, didn't quite realize it trained for it or anything beforehand there but this is very blitzable across here you don't quite have that here but if you had a few german divisions strung out along wherever the coast is and then you know especially if as um terry said if you take gibraltar and you shut down here and reinforce um you know moroccan coast coastal garrisons, maybe with German troops, you might be more cutting off, you know, deeper invasions into the Mediterranean for sure. But then, well, U.S. violates um, Portuguese neutrality by just sort of coming in and taking that over during the war. Once the U.S. is in, basically, you know, setting up anti-submarine operations there and Allowing the local Portuguese officials to continue running, you know, local Portuguese affairs, but anything dealing with the Allies, the U.S. is just in charge, so they do sort of violate there. So um, you can see the U.S. and Britain violating Portuguese sovereignty and just invading there if it was better, or you got all this extra coastal area which doesn't have, you know, Atlantic Wall defenses on it. Um, is much area more areas for air units yeah you can fly air units around but really you can come in so many more invasion areas and yeah you know might not be come in here and blitz across spain but you're only dealing with spanish units that have limited motivations i would say um you know sort of sort of like italy i don't think the Outside of, you know, they, there is the Blue Division that goes fights in Russia, which are filled up with a bunch of phalanges that I think Franco is like, yeah, yeah, you go off and fight the evil atheist communist. Uh, hope you do well. Hope you don't return kind of thing because there are more pains in the ass back home. And yeah, so you have those type of people, but those aren't the majority of Spanish soldiers, and so the majority of Spanish soldiers might not be entirely happy with the U.S., you know, they did get their butts kicked in Cuba and whatnot a, a while ago, but they don't have any great hatred for Britain or for um, the U.S., and didn't, you know, didn't really want to get in and, and you know, just, just have another war after having a, a, a devastating civ civil war. So I don't know that they would fight very hard. So you just end up having more mountain battles for the Wehrmacht. So, yes, yeah, Spain entering into World War II is a bad idea for Germany. Uh, and just something that just Spain, even if you were able to give it sort of wish list ideas of, you know, food, aircraft, tanks, whatever, whatever it is in the, the wish list, um, even if you met all those things you're still not going to get a great ally now when i play particularly like in hearts of iron 3 i like to get spain into the axis but i don't ever have them 
declare war because they still have a few outposts around and sort of the mechanics is if if they're in the access you can base your ships and your aircraft there and whatnot and they're just sort of a sort of neutral a friendly neutral kind of thing and that's good and maybe at some point you know once you've defeated britain and you're thinking invading some other places around the globe you might bring them into the war but they're they're more trouble than they're worth to have in most games so um let's see if there's interesting chat here regarding all of this um hello ikb and Iraq, A7, Franco, a hero, really would never considered a brutal fascist. Well, see, I, he's not a um, fascist, the dictator. He was willing to join the war after France fell. Okay, yeah, but he wanted half of French North Africa. And I would say that his demands against French North Africa are some of the things that Hitler might have been able to, or willing to give him because... He gives up nothing that Hitler wanted. I really think it is more the resources and the food he was demanding. Um, and I, I'm not going to disagree with Brutal, but he lived in a brutal time. He was brutal to the, um, uh, what was it, the Carlists, I think, or whatever that, that rose up, or uh, some mining area. He was, now this is when he was fighting. For the Republic, or Republic of Spain, he brutally put that down. He dealt with um, some of the, the rebellions down in um, Spanish Morocco. So he was brutal, okay, but he lived in a brutal time. Um, I would say people like Eisenhower and um, Patton and Bomber Harris. Hell, Bomber Harris, who was very brutal general, I mean, he was an Air Force you know, Royal Air Force General bombing Berlin. It was a brutal time. We brutally bombed Berlin. You know, so FDR was a brutal leader. He, you know, uh, you know, so all the people that love FDR, he locks up um, in prisons, in, in concentration camps, out in god awful parts of America. And I've been to one of the places that just, you, you barely see any trace of it left, um, out in the California desert. The Japanese American citizens, so FDR is brutal. So you're going to go brutal on me. Um, you know, it was a brutal time. We bombed. We imprisoned our own citizens that um, we thought were a danger. And not just the people like Fritz Kuhn, the leader of the German-American boon, which we had all kinds of evidence against. That's, you know, that's one thing. Another thing, and then they did lock up a lot of German citizens and Italian citizens living in the, in the U.S., but not as many as a percentage. Tokyo firebomb. Yeah, we hey, we nuked two cities. Now, that was under Truman. It was a brutal time. So I, you know, brutal dictator. Well, he was a dictator, yes. But um, brutal, yeah. It's a brutal time. If you... If, if you if you were in government from 1914 to 1945 it was a brutal time i don't i don't think western people understand how brutal it was and uh, you know from the russian revolution and civil war that was brutal um going on in china with the Chinese Sun Yat-sen and the Chinese Revolution against the um, last of the um, what is it Queen Dynasty there with um, Henry Puyi gets overthrown. It's a brutal time in China. Just even without the Japanese effing around in it, China is a brutal situation. And so yeah, the world is brutal. So you need brutal leaders to face up to it. So yeah, he was brutal. So I, I, I'm not going to discount his brutality. Um, you know, we didn't have Google overlords who could spy out who were the wrong thinks, wrong thinkers. You know, they had to go after it. It was brutal. He was not, Franco was not a fascist. And if you think he was a fascist, 
That's because the communists say he was a fascist. And the communists say every single American president is a fascist. You listen to the Soviet propaganda coming out coming out of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. They will describe Democrat or Republican, every single American president as being a fascist. Every single they were always fighting the fascists. They're always smashing the fash. Every 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 enemy of the Soviet Union was fascist whether it would be in Spain or the U.S. or wherever. They were all fascists. So in that sense, yeah, we're all fascists, if you're going to use that bad language, you know, in bad as in mischaracteristic. But Franco, to the best of my knowledge, was never a member of the Spanish Phalangist Party, never a strong advocate for it, um, Yes, his foreign minister, I know, was a phalangist, and there were other phalangists in his government because he was leading a coalition government. And so he um, dealt with them, but he had monarchists, he had, he had um, various forms of capitalist-type elements within there. Just basically everything that wasn't a syndicalist, socialist, or communist was basically in his government. And I'm a friend, I'm not going to say good friend, lived in Spain for part of Franco's regime and quite liked it. And this is more like in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, but quite liked it. I go, yeah, it's, you know, a bit of an authoritarian regime, he said, most assuredly, but it was not a fascist regime. There was a, an attempt at a fascist coup after Franco dies that immediately fails badly. And so, yeah. Um, and your other, okay, yeah, military dictator. Yeah, he was a military dictator. He didn't start the problems. He didn't start the coup that failed, that then went into a civil war. He had, you know... It wasn't until they were starting to assassinate people in large numbers, the Republicans I'm talking about, did he finally start acting and then joined it. So, yeah, military. But what does Franco do? Unlike most military dictators, he sets up a transition to power on his death to a, mo to a constitutional monarchy that is still in Spain today. And yes, I know the people up here will who want or separatists don't like Ma the Madrid central government. Catalan, Catalan is separatist, but otherwise is still a relatively popular, um, relatively democratic um, government under the monarchy. And so he sets up that transition in such a way, by reinstalling a monarchy with a significant democratic base, he does it so that, yeah, you can swing to the socialists, but you can't have, so long as the monarchy is in there, you're not going to have a revolution. You can swing to the right wing if you, you, you want to, but you're not going to go, you know, radical fascist because you still have a, a monarch in there. So you sort of set up a pendulum with just a limited swing to the right and to the left. To the right and to the left. So hopefully no death squads. Hopefully no terrorism. Hopefully no bad things happening. And you swing a little to the right, you swing a little to the left. Set up in Spain. And that's what his legacy to me is in Spain. Is sort of his final hero m movement of setting Spain up as a um, reasonable Western country. So that is why, that is another reason he is also a bit of a hero for me, is he, he, is, he sets up his transition for after his death. You know, at least in the end, he brought back the monarch himself. Yes, he made himself regent for life. Yeah. Uh, how popular was anarchism in Spain at the time? Well, anarchism slash syndicalism was rather popular. Um... Syndicalism as sort of an element of anarchism and whatnot really only takes hold in Spain. I don't know the ideologies in detail of all of the various militia factions on the Republican side. 
Um... Anarchism in Europe in the late 19th, early 20th century may mean different things than when people say anarchism today. I think they generally do. I don't know. It's sort of hard to explain, and I don't want to go into too much detail because I'm probably going to get things wrong on all this. Is this gameplay or history class, guys? This is history class. We're getting back to the gameplay after the end. I guess we're going to end this special episode of Spain and the Second World War. Thanks, everyone, for watching. If you haven't already, please subscribe, like the videos, post your comments below. See you next time for more videos, historical videos.